JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab-created or earth-created, James Allen has over 200,000 conflict-free stones. Then, you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real-time diamond consultations available, where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at jamesallen.com code podcast. That's jamesallen.com code podcast. Welcome to the PowerCat Podcast, GoPowerCat.com's Kansas State Athletics Show. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, from the GPC studios, here's your host, GoPowerCat publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to the latest edition of the PowerCat Questions Podcast. Here from the GPC studios, now featuring fiber. Mmm. It's really good. Uh, of course, I'm talking about our sponsor, Metamucil. I was about to say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. There we go. Tim Fitzgerald, Zach Carlson, the world tour golfer. Cole Carmody, the world tour baseball player guy. And uh, the bartender. You should have said something about poker. Poker. Uh, that is Ryan Gilbert right there. Uh, the whole crew is here today as we knock out both this podcast and, of course, we'll have the overtime later in the week. If you're not familiar with this format, you ask the questions at Wabash Station as one of our VIP subscribers, and we answer for the world to hear. We tried to avoid recruiting on this podcast because that's typically behind the paywall stuff, but today we will wander into that minefield. And what would help you along the way with this recruiting with Kansas State football in particular, is what I'm talking about right now, is a trip to the fridge. Either to drown your sorrows or celebrate the victories on the K-State recruiting front. Get to the fridge and just walk in and say, I need the good stuff. And they'll say, what kind of stuff? The stuff stuff. And after they realize you're not there to buy drugs because they don't sell that, they will then direct you to the wine, spirit, beer, or uh, fruit of your selection. Maybe you just want a really good line. Maybe that's why you're there. Because you can get all that at the fridge, wholesale liquor at the corner, this or that, in the town in which we live. Mm. Do they have the new Imodka? Yeah, I don't think they've officially announced what that is. Is that what it's called? I don't know. I just made uh, that up. It's Yeah, apparently it's going to be a vodka. That's such a weird teaser that K-State put out. I don't... Here's a picture of a definite bottle of alcohol that has the word Ema on it. I would agree. It's sponsored sure. by Meow Wallet. Uh, but here's the thing that bothers me is if you're a student athlete, you can't have an alcohol-based... Sponsorship, NIL, apparently. You know what I also think but is... they can. You know what I think is weird is now, you know, at, at games, Prairie Band will have advertisements on all of the video boards and, you know, on the ad boards, mm-hmm. but you can't... And once sports gambling becomes legal, you know, what? at what point are they not allowed to advertise anymore? Because you can't have gambling in the NCAA. It's a very intriguing thing. Hmm. And now a lot of professional venues will have gambling kiosks at them. Wow. The world is changing dramatically. It's not so long ago when uh, if you placed one bet, somehow the games were getting fixed. Everyone was so worried about it. This won't change that. I don't think anyone's going to. It's more sunshine will expose it. I mean, if there's too much movement now, it'll be obvious. A lot of people are watching. Plus, players are getting paid so much that whatever they can... I'm worried about college. Sure. But that's true now, too. But professionals, there's no way that, for the most part, most guys are not able to impact their team enough to throw a game or... But apparently an NBA official was able to... It's not going to be throwing a game. It's going to be Skylar Thompson's first pass, incomplete or complete, you know, stuff like that. Or, oh, you think props are yeah, props. the way to... That's what I'm mm-hmm. worried about. But even then, if you have a whole bunch of movement on one prop, that's really suspicious. So I agree. Yep. 
Speaking of suspicious, here's our questions from Wabash Station. I don't know who's got him. I've Gills? Got Gills has got it. Gills is at the helm. He's going to make this magic like it's a margarita. Here's Ryan Gilbert. Thank you. From I Like Pickles Cat, why are all of the recruits wearing Letterman-style jackets on their visits? Has the heat index not been 100 or more for the last 10 days in Manhattan? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having some issues here. I'm, I'm just I, – I'm not criticizing K-State in any way, but um, – I think it's more of a generational thing. Got Letterman's jackets, rope hats, and what are they called? Zubas? Zumbas. Zumbas, which I think are hideous. Yep. I'm sorry. I agree. If, it, if they're owned by the Gronks or K State or whoever owns them, I've never been into them. Wait, are they wearing them? Yeah. Uh huh. I thought that was a trend from like 10 years ago. Uh huh. It's like 50 years ago. No, like a no. Thing. They came back like 10 years ago. Right. Kind of thing. It was like a Jersey Shore type thing, right? I don't know. Uh, I'm just bothered by it. I think it's just the retro look. I think that's what they're going for because let's be honest. Now, retro is in style. Do you, do you guys you, – you, you probably remember I agree this, with Fitz, that even but, though I hate how it is. I, it's true. Retro is in style. So is. an example is Champion. Okay. There was a time when Champion in what the '90s was the brand to go to, and then Champion was the brand you found at Walmart. And guess what? Now Champion gear is worth sixty, seventy, eighty dollars. It is one of the it's one of the brand names. Champion that, is a premium brand it is. now, and it, it yeah. did not used to be. No. Like I don't know what ten years ago it was the Walmart brand. So Starters kind of the same way too. Yeah, so watching that. So that is, I think, I think it's awesome. I think it's a great tactic. And personally, I really enjoy the gear that these recruits are. are I, I would never wear it myself, but I do think that, like, if I was in their position as a high school kid, yes, I would wear that because I think it, I think it looks cool. And I think that the retro is the way to go. I mean, it's the same reason, okay? Think about when um, on the field you have these guys that warm up with their jersey that are right under their shoulder pads. Well, you know, when they had the tearaway jersey, guess what? Those jerseys, you could see half their stomach. So, yeah, I mean, it's the same kind wonderful. of thing. It was wonderful. I think Cole wants to see more stomach. Mm. That's not where any of look this is going. Look at the tummy on that guy. Uh, look, this all reminds me that I need to get a T-shirt made that says, I'm not old, I'm retro. I think that's great. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm certain you could go on Amazon right now and find that T-shirt. Uh, no, I want, I want it. You I want to profit from it. I want to I want to make it available to all the other olds, but I'll have to like message them via telegraph. I'm honestly surprised I haven't seen any pushback on, oh, those guys haven't earned that letter. They're wearing a letter jacket that they haven't earned. Why are, why are they wearing that? It's part of the NIL. <laughs> Just give you a letter before you ever sign. What do you think of the hats? I was never a huge rope fan i had some but i just never quite i don't get it What's i don't the like purpose? i don't like rope hats but the rope hats that they were wearing are not good they, they the need rope, a better rope hat the rope was stretched out yeah like it, I, it was a cheap rope hat well i think it was actually a vintage one that had been through some others no the font the font and the design that's a okay it's a it's a today look this is the stuff that makes Zach important to the podcast. He he he's studying the font. It's a it's a fresh hat. It's a fresh hat. So what you're telling me is Zach is no fashionista, but he's pretty fly. I, I, Move on. I, yeah, let's go on. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no more questions about that. I just don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to see Barry at Media Days, won't we? That was, From whatever. Sorry. Whatever. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Move it on. From Pelster, I'll save you from looking at my profile history. Longtime listener, fairly new subscriber. First question. Thank Beautiful. you, Pelster. We yeah, he put that. that there. I appreciate that. Yeah. If you're a listener and you decide to join, I like that format. Just say, That's hey, nice. I'm new. First time. Zach didn't like your uh, texts of choice. Your font of choice, I should say. Okay. He, he wanted a different font. Can you put into context? How what? I have no idea. Okay, go ahead. Read the question now, Gills. <clears throat> it's a clear throat here. Can you put into context how impressive it is for two of Chris Kleiman's first three seasons in what is definitely a rebuild to be eight win seasons? Would K State be in the running for Avery Johnson, Dylan Edwards, Joshua Manning, etc., if they had three consecutive five to six win seasons? No, no, they wouldn't. They probably would. And it is impressive. 
And what actually impresses me is things went off the rails during the pandemic for the program. Everyone, every program had different impacts of it. K-State's lack of depth really was exposed there between illnesses and departures and weirdness. And just, it was, it was a whole season was out of whack. So to respond from that with another eight win season is, it should have been a nine win season. Let's be blunt here. Uh, and, and that's amazing to me that they still accomplished seven wins in the regular season and made what I think we all agree was an essential and now proven change was needed at offensive coordinator, not only for play calling, but a lot of this recruiting is an enthusiasm seen by these younger athletes about playing for Colin Klein as their offensive coordinator. It's there's no denying it. It's it's really impacted K State recruiting. Now to add on to this question, and I appreciate you finally joining the site. Uh, if K State wins ten this year and puts together the recruiting class, we think they're in the midst of doing. It could get really fun, folks. It really could. If they can lock down the state, and not just for one year, make it clear to kids, you want to play at a high level, quit going somewhere else. Stay at home where you're valued. Now, I'm not going to criticize Joe Otting for picking Notre Dame. I mean, that's his childhood fantasy school. I get why he did it, but he's going to be just a guy in South Bend. Just a guy from a place with fans that a place where people don't really care, you know, that you're from Kansas and the fans will also think we could have gotten someone better than this dude from bum. You know what? But you come to K state, you're a God. You're, you're, you're worshiped by the fan base because you're one of the hometown guys. I, I just think if they can really lock in on the state and the state continues to produce, because I think high school football in the state of Kansas, uh, this is a, uh, it's on the rise, and I don't think this is some kind of freak year. It might be high by any standards, but I think the, they will continue to produce a lot of football players out of the state. The fact that K-State has been able to win eight games in two out of three seasons with the talent that they have on their roster currently and the talent that was left there by the previous staff, that is a major accomplishment. You look around at the roster, and the guys that were producing last year, what would you say, maybe besides Cooper Beebe, Deuce Vaughn, those are the two big names I could think of. Those were the guys that were brought in by Chris Kleiman. Everybody else, a lot of those guys were holdovers from Snyder staff. And so the fact that they were able to develop those guys who maybe weren't the highest rated recruits. I mean, we think about a guy like Malik Knowles was a late addition to the recruiting class. Daniel Green had some issues. He was a fairly high recruit, um, but they were able to develop these guys. I mean, Felix Anyadike is another prime example. Now, I understand he was brought in by Chris Kleiman, but um, another one of those guys who fairly unheralded recruits. So if you can combine these diamonds in the rough and now you're starting to add guys who have the the potential to be really good football players you're right that's something special because that ability to develop that ability to coach football games is something that chris Kleiman and, and the staff has excelled at i firmly believe the reason they lost the games they did last year minus texas is because the other team had better jimmies and joes right i mean that at, at the end of the day they lost to better they lost to iowa state because it didn't matter about the X's and O's. The Jimmys and Joes were better. If K State can find a way, they are finding a way with this current recruiting class. We think that they're they could potentially have to increase their Jimmys and Joes to be on an equal, if not greater, playing field than the rest of the Big Twelve Conference. You're right. That is what makes this so impressive, and I think that's what makes it something to look forward to because you have a team like Iowa State who they have been getting talent, but they have not been coaching the talent up. That's why they have not been winning. You have Chris Kleiman, who has been coaching the talent up, the little talent that they've gotten, and now you're starting to see that increase of talent. It makes a potential for something very special. My takeaway is get more Jimmys and Joes. Is that right? And they are. Yeah. Cool. They're working on it. They're working on it. It's, it's impressive. And it can't just be a one-year thing, as I said. It's got to carry over. But I, I think the message is finally set in. And they, these kids now, think about it, though. Chris Kleiman was hired when they were 
coming in as freshmen, right? <laughs> so their high school experience now is Chris Kleiman football. And now they're seeing the success. And I, I really think the bowl game had a hu- huge impact on this, seeing the K-State brand kicking the crap out of the LSU brand. Talk all you want about the rosters. The brands were still out there. I, th- I think made a statement that, hey, coming to K-State, you can play at the high levels that we see in other places. From Go Stay, Kate, how critical is the timing of this in-state football class for K-State? Crucial. I mean, this is this is this is make or break time. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you have this group of kids and everything, the stars align for K State, like there is the potential to have happen, um, then it's 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 insanely crucial. But you look at that on the other hand, if things wouldn't have gone how K State would have liked to this summer, I mean, you're looking at a bunch of fallback options and starting from square one. I mean, that's 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 the honest to goodness truth. If you miss out on these guys that K State feels like they have a great chance at getting, their backup options have to start from square one. I mean, they had uh, a recent commit in Cameron Salas, uh, who was a camp invitee, ended up getting offered. I believe there's only three or four guys, if that, that have even been offered from these camps, which typically is a major selling point. It's a place, hey, come on campus, get coached by these guys. If we like you, we'll give you an offer. A lot of the times that leads to a commitment, but they feel like they have such a great chance that they don't have to, uh, they don't have to, to offer these kids because this in-state class is, is, so, is so good. And it's really come at the perfect time for, for Chris Kleiman. Really I, think, I think it relieves some of the pressure on Chris Kleiman going into this season, maybe even next season. If he lands these guys, you know, if K State has a six and six season this year, you know, it, it doesn't feel as bad as as it may have if you lose out on a bunch of guys. You go six and six and you're like, well, how are we gonna improve? You know, what are what are we gonna do in the future if we didn't get the guys we need? If K State gets the guys they need, I think that it it lifts a lot of pressure. And I don't want to say that that Chris Kleiman's seat would be warm, even, you know, if he has kind of a down year this year and doesn't meet expectations, but it certainly makes the fan base feel better about the team going forward, getting these guys, especially in state guys, finally getting a class where you win, you know, these really good, highly rated recruits that are from your state, get them to stay, which, which has been the foundation of K state football for, Mm -hmm. you know, the last 30 years is finding, guys you know in the state of kansas that are good and now the state of kansas from a high school front they're getting a lot more respect on the recruiting trail from from the services like 24 7 you know there's more eyeballs in this digital era that yeah kansas has guys and they can definitely play at a division one level alan true from 24 7 sports did a wonderful summary of the state of k-state football recruiting you find it over at go power cat right now But he mentioned that the last time Kansas State landed two of the top three prospects in the state was 2004, and they were Matt Boss and Nick Patton, both of whom washed out. And that shows probably the advancement we've made in evaluating talent in the state. Nick Patton was real. They're both really good high school players, but maybe they didn't project at this level quite the way players do nowadays. And I think the talent's just rising. The, as as more institutions come into Kansas, that is a strong indicator. If Oregon keeps coming in, if Minnesota keeps coming in, and certainly Iowa State, Iowa keeps coming into Kansas City area and, and around, it's an indication that the talent is, is level with other places. There just isn't as much of it. I find Oregon's recruiting really interesting because it's a good blueprint for Kansas State. Oregon is also a smaller state. Then, you know, Texas, California, some of those places probably doesn't produce as a high level of players, a high number of players like Kansas. And they also have another power five program in the state that, you know, bleeds off a player here and there. You know, that maybe Oregon State bleeds off more than that. So Oregon goes into like states, apparently, and in Nevada, Kansas, where there's maybe a smaller pool and tries to leach those kids out. And it's it's worked, but it doesn't look like it's going to work with Avery Johnson. With Dan Lanning being a Kansas City guy, 
expect to see Oregon in this area a lot more. Very true. Very true. And I'll, I'll be interested to hear more about his pitch because if you come in with a condescending pitch, I don't think it's going to land right. Wrapping up the first half from third gen Wildcat, assuming football recruiting can keep rolling in the directions they appear to be going. How big of a step in recruiting in is this year from the the past few years? This is enormous. It's enormous. It's it's hard to measure it right now. We won't really know until five years down the road because we'll see what these kids have done on the field and we'll see what followed them. But it is a well-needed change. And honestly, bluntly, Bill Snyder never really locked down the state. Did he get great players? Yeah, yeah. But also back then, Darren Sproles wasn't as heavily recruited as Dylan Edwards. To find the irony in that, I mean, Jordy Nelson wasn't recruited. He wasn't fast enough to play at Kansas, so he walked on at, at K-State. It's just crazy to think how the evolution here. Terrence Newman was a track athlete who didn't move the needle on the football field much at all. Mark Semino was probably undersized in the eyes of the big programs and turned out to be a dominating linebacker. You just go back through it, and the foundation is so much what Kansas State's done has been with Kansas kids supplemented with the Michael Bishops from Texas, the Colin Kleins from Colorado. You go out and you know find some other kids that – that can move into the mix, but you got to have that thread of this is my home state school and I'm playing for the pride of the purple. And I know we don't like to talk about KU on this podcast, but I feel like if we don't bring them up in the conversation, we we don't talk about those things. If we don't bring them up in the conversation, you're really doing a disservice to how important this class is and how important this recruiting in the state is. Uh, I've talked to multiple coaches in the in the Kansas City area and the thing that I found most fascinating with this whole class is Kansas has made it sound like they don't believe that you can have a foundation recruiting Kansas kids. They don't believe that Kansas kids can be the foundation of their recruiting class. Now, is that because all oh, the good Kansas kids are going to K-State? Well, maybe that would make a little bit of sense. But to me, as much as we want to give that staff at KU credit for trying to increase their in-state recruiting, increase their recruiting in, in Kansas City. I mean, the fact that Chris Klein and, and Colin Klein, because you mentioned it earlier, Fitz, Colin Klein is the main horse on all of this. Um, the fact that they are not only beating KU, but they're beating Iowa. They've been beating Iowa State, which was a major thorn in the side of K-State. Um that's huge. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge step in the right direction. Uh, there definitely is still some work to do because, again, it's one thing to take two steps forward, but if you take two steps backwards, then you're not going anywhere. So it's important to follow up You know these classes. Um, if you want to grade this as an A class next year, if they need to have a B class, right? I mean, they need to have a very similar. Um, you you have to have you have to have a floor because right now K State's floor has been very low. Just because you hit close to your ceiling, you've got to raise that floor a little bit. Well, they've had this core group of players they've been working on for a while, and Andre Davis caught us a little bit off guard. It kind of came out, you know. I think he just jumped on his offer, knowing that they were going to get other receivers. But this is a very offensive heavy year in the state, which works well for K-State because they've neglected the offensive side of the football, whether it was uh, the offensive coordinator or just the efforts. They're really thin at running back. They're really thin at receiver. And they've done okay at quarterback, but they want to add one every year. They've done good on the off. They've done well on the offensive line, I guess would be the right way to say it. But this year they're struggling. So here's my measurement uh, with the momentum of this class. How massive can the momentum be? Let's say hypothetically they do land Dylan Edwards, who is announcing Thursday at noon in in Derby. And then Avery Johnson, who we think has moved his announcement back, but we're not for sure. They add Joshua Manning out of the Kansas City metro area that we kind of count as in-state, Lee Summit. With the great downtown, as Coles told mm-hmm. us. Um, 
What happens with Calvin Clements? He came on a visit. Our Ryan Wallace said he's still probably Baylor or Kansas. But if you're Calvin Clements and you see this wave of in-state kids going to K-State and K-State making it very clear, we need you because we're, we need an offensive tackle in this class and you're our guy, does that warm him up a little bit? That's going to be w- one of the guys I keep an eye on. But what's amazing about this is how deep this class goes in the state of Kansas. You're going to see guys well outside of the top 10 in the state get power five offers. And, you know, I they'll probably, if they're going to end up somewhere, they're going to end up at Kansas or Kansas State. I think one of the biggest reasons there's so much hype right now is because Johnson and Edwards are both skill position guys, right? If right. There was, that was a People safety that. and a linebacker, right. even if they're the same exact you know, skill talent at a different position, there's not that much hype. So, you know, moving forward, let's say next season, K-State, you know, you're probably not going to get that big name quarterback or running back because there's somebody a class ahead of them. You've got to fill those gaps in at other positions. They're not going to get as much hype. But, you know, this is a good floor, like you said, Cole, to start at. You can't let this be the, the peak of your recruiting at K-State if you're climbing. No, I agree. Um, I, and keep an eye on John Randall Jr. We don't know what he's going to do, and he liked his K-State visit. He's actually the second-ranked player in the state according to 24-7 zone rankings behind Avery. So keep an eye on him. I, I know his dad played at Kansas. His uncle played at Oklahoma State. But I think K-State's in the mix here, too. So if if that if the momentum picks him up along the way, and let's be honest, they're looking for multiple running backs. I think they're going to sign three. Mm-hmm. If they can find three, mm-hmm. they sure as hell are going to sign three receivers. Because next year, 23, these guys might need to play. I mean, they're, they're going to be really stressed at receiver. They're probably going to have to sign three and find a transfer portal guy. And the guys that are looking at at receiver are probably good enough to play. Right. Joshua Manning uh, certainly is. This is fun. I just told and I mentioned Alan True earlier in the podcast. I just texted him and said, "We've never really had this. I've been covering K State football for since '95 on full time basis. We've never had this kind of recruiting at this level with in state prospects. It just hasn't existed. And so the bounce that other sites and other other schools get from recruiting just hasn't been a tangible part of covering Kansas State football. So this is not only fun; it's a little bit foreign." Go Powercat will be in Derby on Thursday for the announcement with multiple staff members. Follow along. Make sure you're subscribing. We've got a lot of intel going on to our message boards. Uh, you know, we we try to keep it on the message boards as best as possible. But Ryan Wallace is absolutely kicking butt on this Kansas recruiting. That will do it for the first half of the Powercat Questions podcast. On the other side, we'll delve into the future of the quarterback position at Kansas State. And there's a lot more to come, too. We're sponsored by The Fridge, and we will be right back. GoPowerCat.com's Powercat podcast continues after this short break. JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab-created or earth-created, James Allen has over 200,000 conflict-free stones. Then you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real-time diamond consultations available, where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at jamesallen.com code podcast. That's jamesallen.com code podcast. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash 247 and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. 
Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, permitted parishes only, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Wyoming. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia or call one 800 522 to 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24/7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York or visit oasas.ny.gov/gambling. Standard text messaging rates apply. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Utah, and other states where prohibited. Welcome back to the Power Cat podcast. Now, let's return to the GPC Studios. Welcome back to the PowerCat Questions Podcast, sponsored by our friends at Fridge Wholesale Liquor right here in beautiful Manhattan, Kansas, although um, all of our trees are a little bit beaten up now. I had to haul more limbs out of the yard after another smaller storm on Tuesday night, but it finished off some limbs. Tree limbs, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Yeah. yeah there was a, an arm and some guy's <laughs> leg and some random limbs. We're sponsored by The Fridge. As I said, get into The Fridge every time you're in Manhattan. And I mean every stinking time. Just go in and say hello. I hear Fitz likes you guys. You must be okay. More of your questions. Cole Carmody is going to take over. Of course, I'm Tim Fitzgerald. Zach Carlson, Ryan Gilbert are also along and with uh, two dogs that are being peaceful. A little bit farty, but peaceful at the moment. And here we go. Your question's from Wabash Station, and we started off with the bang. First question of the second half comes from Ohio Power Cat. What is the path to the field for the quarterbacks K-State currently has on the roster with the possible quarterback being added in 2023? It's competitive. It's going to be competitive. I think Will Howard's a heartbeat away. Yeah. Essentially. I mean, he's there if anything happens to Adrian Martinez. And if Adrian Martinez doesn't live up to the hype and the expectations, I think that Casey has no problem putting Will Howard in whenever they feel like it. But yeah. beyond that, I, I, I think, I think that Jaron when, Lewis is after Will Howard. Jaron Lewis is third string. I think he still is. But I think once you get, I think you still get, if you get to that point, you're still worried. And I think that the day that Avery comes in, I think that he's at least level with Jaron and Jake, you know, in 2023. So I think that, you know, I'll say it now. I think that if if Avery Johnson commits and comes to K-State, I think that he will be the backup quarterback on the depth chart first game 2023. I'm not going to disagree with that. I'm not. I mean, I think their idea will be to get him four games, but I think if you're Colin Klein, you're hoping it goes Adrian Martinez, Will Howard, Avery Johnson, and I know a lot of you are like oh, Jake Rubley. No, well, well, Adrian, Adrian's gone. Yes. No, Just, I mean oh, this season, this Adrian season. Oh, got you. you. Okay. Then yes. Will Howard. Yes. Okay. And then that was a year by year yeah. and not a depth chart. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. And. Um, the the gap between Adrian and Will is not that big right now. It just isn't, folks. I I know he's struggled in games in the past, but I, I think we're going to see him continue to have the game slow down for him, a little bit less panic. You know, I think that's what it is. I think it's all pushing when he, he gets into a game situation and he doesn't show that in practice from what we hear. So if he can get over that hump, it'll be enormous. And... uh I think Colin Klein will benefit him too. I think they're very similar, and even though Will I think's got a a better arm. That doesn't say much because Colin didn't have a great arm at all. But um, I think he he has an understanding how to coach these kind of guys. 
Now, if you're out there worried about Jake Rubley, he's got a lot to prove. He's he's still got a lot of things he's got to accomplish before he can be considered in the mix at quarterback. They're right. He's probably number four heading into this season. It shouldn't be that way. But again, he's a cautionary tale about recruiting rankings and actually having to get to work and accomplish things at the college level. If you don't show up and get your work done, I don't care how many stars you carry. You ain't going to play. He's talented. Like, He's let's talented. let's throw that out there, right? So maybe this Avery Johnson or whoever comes in at quarterback for 2023, that could help him. I mean, like, we've sat and talked on this podcast a lot about, you know what? It's time for Jake Rubley. It's time for him to go, right? It's time for him to show up. It's time for him to go to work, get in there, and prove himself. And depending on the type of kid he is, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk to him because he, he just hasn't been on the field, right? So we haven't really talked to him. Um but we'll find out what kind of kid he is because there's two ways there's two ways this could go. He could see the quarterback that's on his heels coming in next year, and he could feel like, crap, I need to get out of here. I need to go somewhere I want to play. And honestly, I don't think K State fans would be too sad. Or some would. Some would, sure. Or he could take the Will Howard approach and say, Hey, I'm gonna fight through this. I'm going to earn a spot because guess what? The taking is still there. You could very well see Jake Rubley as the starting quarterback next year. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen, but if he takes major steps forward this year and they feel like, you know what, we still like Will, guess what? Will Howard is big enough to have a Sammy Wheeler-type position transformation and play tight end. I don't think that's out of the question, especially if they feel like Jake Rubley has developed a lot and they feel like he has a potential at the position. Now, all that being said, do I think that's likely? No, I don't. But... There is a way for Jake Rubley to see the field at K-State. There, there just is. I mean, anytime there is a change in quarterback, there will be a quarterback battle. And Jake Rubley will surely be considered in that if he is still around in Manhattan. Well said. I agree. Okay, next question <clears throat> comes from El Camino Cat. Switching over to basketball, is Marquise Noel poised to have the greatest statistical season for a true point guard in K-State history? Is 14 points and 6 assists per game too optimistic? Would that be the greatest statistical is that, season? Is that really the greatest statistical I don't, season for I don't a think true that's... point guard? Isn't Jake Pullen a point guard? Yeah. yeah. Was he considered a tr- was, would you consider Jacob mm-hmm. Pullen a true point, point I mean, guard? No, he scored a hell lot. Yeah. I mean, he ran the point. Clemente is more similar to Noel's style of play, though. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know how Noel can pass his legacy unless they make a run to the Elite Eight or better. Statistical season, though? I mean, I mean, if that's what we're looking at. I don't know if I don't and I don't maybe I don't know if this question is asking is 14 points and six assists the best game statistically or the best season statistically as a K-State point guard. I don't know who he would be who El Camino Cat would be referencing with that Um, personally. Look, I'm not too caught up into what the raw numbers are like that. How did you get to the 14 points? That's what I want to know. What was the journey here? Or did you Russell Westbrook? That's not easy to say. Russell Westbrook, <laughs> that thing? Yeah. And he, did you harden it? You just took 1,000 shots and you got your 14 points and the team lost? Well, that's not productive at all. Again, I don't want this to sound like I'm banging on Marquise Noel, but the kid needs to edit his game. He has such upside to him that he – has to get rid of some of the bad habits. And that includes his his sense of invincibility that doesn't prove to be true on the floor. And what I mean by that is you want a kid that wants to take the last shot. you, you got to have that. But it has to be someone that is going to hit it. He's got to be Rodney Magruder. Got to be Jake Poland. And right now I don't, I don't see that from him. I don't see the consistent outside shooting that – you need to have at that position. I hope this coaching staff can get through to him in some of these ways. And I sense that they might be, but excuse my caution that I think Ryan Gilbert shares with me. He nodded his head. He said, I didn't say anything. That, that that nod, the kind of turn of his head meant the boss is wise. He's a wise. It's like sitting here with Yoda that eats too many snacks. (laughs) I think if if Marquise Noel sets any sort of records for points per game or whatever as a as a point guard, it's because he was Russell Westbrook, and it was because K State lost twenty plus games. Yep, that's mm-hmm. the only way Marquise Noel is 
quote unquote, getting his. And that's, you know, it's going to be the Marquise Noel show if he's setting records and it's not going to be about K-State. And I think the other end of that is if K-State's winning games and K-State's competing and they're up in the Big 12 standings, I think that means that Marquise Noel probably isn't playing very much. I think that I, I think that a lot of guys could emerge ahead of Marquise Noel that are taking points, taking minutes that if K-State's being successful, I don't think it's going to necessarily be coming from Marquise Noel. I agree. You guys want to know something crazy? Yeah. Noel averaged over three turnovers a game in each of his three seasons at Little Rock. Only two and a half last season for K-State. And we were frustrated with him at times last season. He's shown that he can turn the ball over a lot more. Well, and the, again, that, that gets to him probably at Little Rock thinking or knowing he was more of the show. And last year he had Pack and he had Smith and, you know, he had some other parts around him. He doesn't next year. Let's be blunt here. They don't have a lot of dudes that come in and are proven scorers. If you look at this roster, the most proven scorer right now is Marquise Noel. So we'll see how it pans out. So I've I've done some exhaustive research over here. Like in the last minute? Yeah. He has his calculator app open. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm going to look at the top three scores from K State last year. Nigel Pack obviously was first with seventeen point four points a game. Mark Smith, twelve point seven, Marquise Noel, twelve point four. As a team, so that, that equals forty one total points. As a team, K State averaged sixty nine points a game. Very nice number. So, anybody want to do the math? What's 69 minus 41? 28. Okay. Thank you. So, are we in agreement that between Marquise Noel, Desi Sills, and Ish Masood, those are the three, as the roster sits today, the three most likely candidates to lead or to be the top three scorers on the team? Sure. Okay. So, that means that they have to find a way for K-State to be, to average 69 points a game, which... Again, we don't know how they're going to be, but if we think they're going to be as good on defense, that the defensive improvement would likely be greater than the offensive improvement last year. I mean, that's that's if that's what we're looking at, that's probably the most likely scenario. So let's say K-State wants to average 69 points a game and grind out every single game, which I don't think K-State fans would be very ideal with. But either way, let's say that happens. 70 points a game, 69 points a game, pretty average in college basketball. So. That means that they will have to find a way in order to to have your top three scores, if you want it structured like last year, to have 41 points. Can Marquise Noel, Desi Sills, and Ish Masood, between the three of them, average 41 points a game? Good point. Because honestly, I don't think that Marquise Noel averaging two more points a game to what he averaged last year would be that terrible of a thing, especially – especially if you have um, a Desi Sills who can maybe average the same amount. Because let's be honest, he was a proven scorer at Arkansas State, and he was a proven scorer at Arkansas too. I don't think it is that wild of an idea that Desi Sills can have a Mark Smith-type season. I think they're very similar to players. I think Desi Sills maybe is able to get to the cup a little bit better than Mark Smith was, and he was pretty good at that last year, right? Um they couldn't rebound the ball last year. Mark Smith averaged eight rebounds. I don't think that's going to be an issue this year with the length they have. So there's lots of different factors that looking at this roster. But I think in order for K-State to be good next year, they have to take the money ball approach. And I've talked about this, talked about that on this podcast before. But it's not about how do you replace 17 points in Nigel Pack. It's how do you disperse that mm-hmm. equally amongst the guys that you have coming onto the roster. And so – if Marquise Noel goes out and averages 12 points a game, 14 points a game, and can limit the turnovers, I, I don't think that that is that wild of, of – I you should expect that improvement. 14 points a game and six assists for your point guard, especially when your other point guard just left to go to Miami, that's two points a game better and one assist better. I think he can realistically do that and play a diff- and play a more condensed style of game. I really do. And I- I want to add, I think David Gasson's going to be a player. I, I mean, yeah. he was trapped on the depth chart at Virginia Tech. I think he's going to surprise people. I think he's got some serious game. I don't think that, that K-State's going to have three scores, score whatever, how many points, that what your hypothetical situation, whatever. 
I don't think that'll happen. And if I'm a K-State fan, I don't want that to happen. Uh, the way Tang recruited these players, you want, you know, Colbert to come in, score a few points a game. Like you mentioned with Gasson, you want him to score five a game, right? You want little pieces contributing throughout the roster. You don't just want Noel and Masood and Sills to be your only scores. I think the staff really emphasized uh, having guys that can score throughout the roster and not just stockpiling it at the top of the of the list. It just opens up it opens up a Pandora's box of of things and, and the more that we sit here and talk about it, the more that I think you can look at it from different lights, right? And and last year we weren't able to do that. So I just think that's important to keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, next question, staying on the basketball topic, comes from Kaned. Last season, Bruce Weber played nine players, 10-plus minutes per game. Please compare the top nine players from last year to the nine players on next year's team. Is the overall talent, offensive and defensive, elevated? I, I don't know about defensive. Uh, they're going to be extremely long, and that always helps. Yeah. I, I mean, if you start trading out this guy for that guy, this guy for that guy, you win every battle in my estimation until you get to the very top and then there's no comparison there's no pack there's there's no smith there's just there isn't i mean and even if noel's better even if masood's better let's let's lay it online here they need to go find a dude still they need someone that can is a more natural free-flowing scorer and they've missed on those opportunities i don't know where they're going to find them but by god they need to find one i think they know that I think they know they can't win at a high level by committee. You can win games. You can be comparable to last year's team and maybe a little bit better by committee. But you're not going to take that big step that K-State fans would like. And I thought they were going to take. But, you know, all the early optimism has turned into nothing. But I am still incredibly optimistic about the future. They're getting four- and five-star recruits to come to Manhattan, Kansas. Yeah, I know Bruce Weber recruited some guys and maybe got a guy here or there to come to visit, but it never was tangible. It never was, people. There was no closing there. There was it was never going to happen. These guys know how to close, so let's let's see what happens. So, do we want to do this player by player basis? Because no, I don't. No, I, I mean, I, I understand the question. I, I I answered it. I think until you get to the top, it's better. All across yeah. the board. And even then, I mean, I, like I said, I think you could very well see a Desi Sills-like season with Mark Smith. I don't think that's out of the question. It's very similar, very similar. Uh, a Mark Smith-like season. A Mark Smith-like season, season Desi with Desi Sills. Sills. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> very similar situations. Um, but there's no way you look at this at this team, minus the, the top three guys from last year. There's no way. I'm sorry. There's no way you can look at this team that K-State has right now, the six other guys, and say the six guys last year were better. Because you want to talk about being unproven? Those guys last year didn't prove anything. Mm -hmm. They didn't prove anything. So, yeah, I'm sorry if I feel like just because they have more potential because we don't know what they can do, I feel like giving that group the nod over last year's group – is that has to be the only answer. Like every single player, higher potential than this bottom six last year. Generally speaking with Weber, it didn't matter how, how hard you wanted to work out, you know, off the court, in practice, whatever, you're going to play. Unless you are totally in the doghouse, you're, you're not going to be worrying about not starting. I think with Tang, it's going to be a lot different. You've got to be putting in 100% effort every day off the court in practice, in the weight room, all that stuff. And if you're not, you're not, you're not guaranteed a spot on the roster. And with Weber, it felt like you were, unless you really, you know, messed up in a big way. So these guys are working a lot harder uh, than any player probably ever did under Weber. That's not a knock on those guys, but the standard is just so much higher. So I don't care how we want to compare this season's roster to last season's, you know, Ignore the X's and O's that I think Tang is going to really thrive with just off the court. I've mentioned it. Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. So I'm not concerned about the roster at all. Uh, They're going to be competitive in every game, even if they're going up against Kansas or whoever the best team is in the Big 12. Are they going to get blown out by 50? No. Are they going to win the game? Probably not, but they're going to be competitive. Very good. Okay, last question of the podcast comes from 
Imarica. Mm-hmm. I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> what is a realistic scenario concerning additional Big 12 expansion? How does it come about? How many join and who are they? Well, I think they're still looking. Sadly, I think they're looking at 14, which makes no sense. Makes no sense to me. Why would you do 14? Just go to 16, 12 or 16. 14 has been a nightmare for the SEC and Big 10. So let's do it too. And they're all both going to get out of it. I'm confident that the Big Ten is going to add elements. Probably from the ACC if they can get them out of there. But I'm confident of it. It's not going to be Kansas and Iowa State. What good would that do, the Big Ten? It wouldn't do anything. It so, lowers their academic prestige. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really counting on the recruiting trail right now. They need to go to 16. I really believe that the conference needs to take that risk. They need to be – Conference USA tried it, but, I mean, it was a bust because it's it's a low-profile conference. I think if you're 16 from coast to coast, covering every time zone, you got an ass-kicking – media rights package you can present to someone. You can say, look, you, we're going to give you inventory in every time zone. And we have so many games, we can shift some to Thursday. We can shift some to streaming for that platform. I think it's a powerful incentive to someone for an entity such as CBS, since we're affiliated with that, I'd hope it'd be CBS, to sink its teeth into. Kind of a, a backbone. You know, maybe they want Big Ten games. Well, that's great. That's great for the Big 12. Go get that Big Ten game. Go get that, uh, you know, maybe the big noon kickoff with Ohio State once in a while and then back it up with Kansas State and BYU after that. I think we're going to find that people respond to this. I just saw a tweet, uh, speaking of Ohio State, a tweet from an Ohio State fan or media person, I don't know, that said with all the – Logos of the new Big 12, minus Texas and Oklahoma, how fun this conference is going to be. I think the nation is beginning to realize this conference is going to be fun. Now, if you add in another East team and three West teams, particularly if you can purge, you can steal from the Pac-12, which I think is on the table and what they're eyeing, man, he got something. And I I don't know if it's Memphis or or – South Florida or someone we we don't even imagine. What if the Big Ten does turn their attention to the ACC? Well, okay. Can you get an ACC program to come out? Can you get a Florida State that isn't going to be invited into the SEC? It's all out there. It's This is a fun time to be covering Big 12 football. Not if you're paying the bills for the travel. But... Um, it's going to be a great time, and there'll be so many games on TV that will be competitive. And I'll say this. I think Kansas is going to improve. How much? I don't know. But remember, when they hired Bill Snyder, we just wanted to win four games, five games. Does this sound familiar? Now, Kansas is in a far better position than K-State football was in 1988. But it's there. If they can get to win in four or five games— Make more games competitive. At, at the very least, be more competitive. Beat Texas um, every time you can until the conference alters its membership. I'm all in on the new Big 12. And it's not just because um, I I'm cover it and I need to be optimistic. I think it's going to be a blast. And it's going to be hyper competitive. Mm-hmm. Now, some will spend that as weakness. That's okay. We know it will probably be strength. Cincinnati is positioning itself to be the football power. You see their recruiting class? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fifth in the nation? They're in a hotbed. Ohio is a great high school football state. I'm fired up. I, I I, do hope they add more in the West. And if it's not Pac-12 teams, if it is Colorado State and San Diego State and I'll say it, UNLV, I'll still feel good about things. Because, folks, the lessons of TCU, of Utah, of so many other programs that have had the opportunity to suddenly get Power 5 money, it's it's real. You change everything. I don't care what Colorado State's been in the past. Give them Power 5 money, and they will surpass Colorado in 
athletics. They will because they care. They want to be good. It's more of a college environment. Uh, well, not a long time, but yeah, I'm fired up about the new Big 12. I think Bob Huggins said it best. Why settle for UNLV when Arizona and Arizona State are available? Did he say that? Yeah, it's something like something it. Something like that. Very, very similar. But, I mean, my thing is, I think that the Pac-12 is, you know, prime for, for picking. I think that you can probably even get better schools than Arizona and Arizona State. And, you know, you can throw in Utah. I know that you just dogged on Colorado, but I think Colorado would come back to the Big 12 in a heartbeat. I think even even if you look at the other Power 5 conferences, if the ACC is getting purged by the SEC and the Big 10, who's to say that the Big 12 can't grab a couple schools there that, that may fit well? You know, they fit well with West Virginia, fit well with Cincinnati. You know, a team like Pitt. Pitt's not going to the SEC. Pitt's not going to the Big 10. Mm. You know, they might want to be with some – geographical natural rivals you know, there's there's teams <laughs> he'd be so happy he gills, would be. Would, gills would love it um you know there's teams out there virginia tech is virginia tech good enough to get into the big 10 no does the sec want virginia tech probably, probably not. not does virginia tech want to be in a lessened acc versus a big 12 that you know you can like I said, you've got that kind of regional basis over there with West Virginia and, you know, some natural geographical rivals. You know, I think that there are some schools that you may not consider as being on the table for the Big 12 to take right now. But I think that if, you know, after a couple of years of this new Big 12 without OU in Texas and with the four new schools, and if everybody's seeing kind of some seeing success and the money hasn't fallen off, I think that you could position yourself well to say, hey, come check us out. You know, you're going to make more money. You're going to be happier here. And you're going to be able to compete for championships because we're a great league. I think that um, selling yourself short on wanting, oh, let's go get Memphis. You know, let's go get Colorado State or whoever. You know, it's fine. Those, those schools, I think, would be fine in the Big 12 if it came down to it. But don't sell yourself short when there are some Power 5 schools that I think would certainly be a lot happier in the Big 12 than where they are currently. Let me add this. Uh, my good friend Old Fellow sent me a couple links today to some stories. And one of them was quoting Chuck Ninus, former Big 8 commissioner, interim Big 12 commissioner, and czar of college football. I mean, everyone just loves Chuck Ninus. Talking about how uh, what a mistake it was for Nebraska and Missouri to leave the Big 12, that it's damaged them. They're complete outsiders in their conferences. And I agree with that. And he also said probably Texas A&M too. Texas A&M would have been highly competitive in the Big 12 if they hadn't left. And if those teams hadn't left, schools hadn't left, we wouldn't be seeing Oklahoma and Texas leave. I agree with it. And then he just said, let's not even discuss Colorado, basically. Because Colorado was always an outsider in the Big 8. Mm -hmm. It was a cultural outsider from the very start, but it's become more so now. They don't care about athletics at Colorado. It is such a Pac-12 mentality there. I don't want them back. I I would love to have Boulder back. I love the mountains. I love all that. But I'll take four Collins if that's the play. I mean, if the play is add Utah, add Arizona, Arizona State to be with BYU, that's incredibly solid. You've added solidified Utah and Arizona. But I also think the play might be a little bit different. I think Arizona and Arizona State's arrogance have turned off some Big 12 people, and they might go, okay, well, you guys have fun. We're going to take Utah and, you know, maybe Colorado and then Colorado State. And you've got this continuous flow now from Kansas to Colorado to Utah. It makes sense. Makes sense to me. But as we pointed out, if the ACC starts getting cherry picked somehow, that the media rights contract is tested. And that's really what, you know, we've seen this. Money will get you out of anything. And that's so true. I mean, when it comes to realignment, money will get you out of it. If the Big Ten wants Virginia and North Carolina, like I think they do, they can make it happen. If the SEC wants to go to 24 schools, which I wouldn't doubt, 
They can take four teams from the PAC, four teams from the ACC, and have their super conference. But if that happens, then you have really good options in the East. So do you have BYU out West and you add Utah and slide, heaven forbid, Tech and Oklahoma State or K-State into the Western pod? Which kind of suck, but, I mean, that's also tangible. A lot of things on the horizon. I'm eager to find out who they add as the Big 12 commissioner. I hope that I hope it'll be introduced at media days. We'll all be there. I wasn't going to go, but now I'm thinking, I don't think I have the commish. I probably need to pop off. Ooh, this is news to me. Yeah, I think I'm going to go. Ooh. I'm, but I'm going to sleep in the back seat and you guys can drive. <laughs> I'm not going to be sleeping. I'll sleep with you. Uh, thank you. We got to get out of this podcast. I'm looking forward to it, Gills. Thanks for listening to the Powercat Questions podcast. Remember, the overtime arrives on Friday. The Life of Fitz will arrive on Sunday or Monday, depending on when I get it. Don't know who it's going to be this week. I've got next week's guest all lined up, or two weeks from now. But you know what I'm saying. It gets so confusing. My life's very confusing. I'm going to shut up. Thank you for listening to the Powercat podcast. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked. Temperature set. Lost car found. Get complimentary class-leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details.